Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. The smartphones in our pockets have the computing power of an entire office block filled with the most advanced military supercomputers from just 40 years ago. Now, the British Army is about to start testing smartphone software which can talk direct to drones to build 3D images of the battlefield and advise on tactical options in minutes. When I was in the Marine Corps, you know, we used to cut MRE boxes and make little replicas of the towns. Imagine having a near real-time 3D produced model to be able to walk through the operation and then adjust your scheme of maneuver on the fly. We'll also hear how the system has been used already in Ukraine as President Zelensky calls for Russia to lose its veto at the UN Security Council. Please hear me. Let unity decide everything openly. Russia expert Emily Ferris is with us, so we'll talk about whether the UN set up to protect peace after World War II can play any part in ending the wars of the 21st century. And we'll hear how three quarters of NHS hospitals have been approved as veteran friendly. They will know about veterans and be ready for veterans. And therefore, I think veterans can approach those with confidence. We're in a much better place than we were even five years ago. Zitrap with Kate Chabot and Emily Ferris. So Mike is out this week, but I'm delighted to have Emily Ferris with me. Hi, Emily. Hi, good morning. Uh, Emily is a research fellow at the defence think tank Rusi. Welcome. Um, the Ukraine war has led the debate at the biggest get together of world leaders, the UN General Assembly, Emily. But President Putin was a no show and he wasn't the only one. Other absentees include the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the French President Macron. How meaningful is this? Well, I think from the Russian perspective, the way that they tend to use forums like the UN is really to put forward um, their own agendas. So if the UN can be sort of manipulated to serve Russian political gains, like trying to get people to fall behind Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, then Russia will engage with it. But Russia tends to use platforms like the UN to to push forward its own agenda, not really in search of a common cause, like uh, addressing issues like climate change. So when the UN's not really considered of use to the Kremlin, Russia tends to disengage with it. Well, there's lots to talk about on that, Emily. Stay with us. But before we do, um, I want to look at a piece of technology that has been used in the Ukraine war and is now about to be trialled by British soldiers. It's not a new piece of hardware, but instead software that can run on a mobile phone. It's called Farsight and can create 3D maps in minutes by connecting handheld surveillance drones directly to handheld devices. Second Battalion, the Royal Yorkshire Regiment, will be testing Farsight in a few weeks' time as part of the Army warfighting experiment. Former U.S. Marines Major Owen Cahill, whose experience includes special operations in Syria, is part of the team from Reveal Technologies, which developed Farsight. He's been telling me what British soldiers can expect from the system and how it's been put to use in Ukraine. We had uh, an instance from the Ukraine where the Russians had actually rocketed a middle school that was uh, just outside of Kyiv and... You know, the narrative was that this was a good military target for the Russians. This is a weapons depot. This is a staging area. Um, there were potential uniformed um, Ukrainian soldiers there. And so what we were able to do is produce a 3D model that was several city blocks long of this, you know, downtown urban built up area with 20 story buildings, 30 story buildings, you know, bustling kind of downtown. And we were able to show the greater context and, and like a battle damage assessment of sorts saying that, no, this was, in fact, a working middle school in a built-up urban area that was not a good military target. So for someone who hasn't seen it, what does this product look and look and feel like? Yeah, it's a very intuitive user interface. So we what we do is, in a matter of minutes, present the end user with a intuitive 3D model that gives them much more situational awareness about the battle space that they're operating in. And what that translates to is being able to make decisions faster than your enemy because we offer um, helicopter landing zone tools, we offer height distance tools, we offer line of sight analysis, route planning, and all of that is interoperable with ATAC, which is, you know, over here, the command and control um, medium of choice for Special Operations Command of the U.S. Army. And the ability to share those models now to adjacent units, higher units, subordinate units, increases the situation across the entire formation. It sounds a bit like having a a local Google Earth on your phone. 
Yeah, and and the best part is, is that it is not on traditional photogrammetry or 3D modeling timelines, which you know can be hours or even days. That requires a persistent internet connection to both upload that data and then receive it. So ours is just processed on the device, immediately available to the user. The timeline is is drastically shrunk down. So being able to speed up again that decision making cycle for our friendly units to be able to make decisions faster than their adversaries um, is really the key innovation that we've been able to kind of crack. And yeah, it's like having Google Earth, but tailored specifically to those tactical questions. That is what a soldier is going to see actually live, real time. Yeah, so um, we do have a live stream function with certain platforms that we're adding new platforms all the time. But it is it usually is in, in a couple of minutes, depending on the size and the type of sensor that you're using. Um, you know, most of our models are available in under 10 minutes. And how can it, the fact that it's 3D, that landscape, how can it help soldiers do their job? There are benefits to being able to see your operational battle space in a 3D context. You don't really get the type of situational awareness by looking at a 2D model or even looking at a, you know, 1 to 50,000 map. And, you know, if you talk about that from a mission planning context, you know, the traditional way when I was in the Marine Corps, you know, we used to cut MRE boxes and make little replicas of the towns or the, the objectives that we were going to be going into. Imagine having a real time or near real time 3D produced model to be able to walk through the operation. And then while you're conducting the operation, adjust your scheme of maneuver on the fly based on the situation on the ground. So kind of groundbreaking. And how, how much confidence can soldiers have in those 3D models or the recommendations that come from them? Yeah, there's there's significant confidence, or we, we are significantly confident in the outputs. We're working with a bunch of entities over here in the U.S. to be able to register our models on top of known points on the Earth so that you can use them potentially in a fires context. So the, the relative accuracy of our models is extremely high, and we're working to even tighten that up even further for the absolute accuracy. Are you able to tell us a little bit technically how it works without giving away any uh, security um, issues? Sure, yeah, no. I mean, photogrammetry is not a new technology. The way that we've kind of changed it or, or, or implementing it a little bit differently is by that processing on the end user device. So by taking multiple images of an objective being flown by a UAS, we're able to stitch together a 3D model. Typically, that's done by sending that data to a cloud to process or a server stack somewhere. Um, and that, again, would require you to then have that persistent internet connectivity to then receive those outputs, whereas it's all being done locally, disconnected from any type of tactical environment or cloud processing. So, so your phone is doing the work. Does this mean it's less a reliance on comms that could be interfered with? Correct. Yeah. So if you're going to be flying a drone anyway, you know, why not build a 3D model? All we're doing, it's a, it's a ingest only software. So the, all we're doing is harnessing that information that's coming down anyway. So you're not even pumping anything additional out into the radio frequency or the RF environment. So what equipment's needed? If, if the UK decides to actually buy Farsight, is it going to need a new fleet of drones to make it worthwhile? No, the, the benefit to our software is that it was designed to work with legacy systems and all oncoming systems as well. So we're, we're constantly in touch with the original equipment manufacturers all over the globe. Um, Parrot and Afi is a, is a great platform for us. We know that that is a, a capable platform and one that's preferred in the UK at the moment. Um, but we work with a whole host of, you know, large drone manufacturers to be able to keep up with what's coming online, what is you know, top of mind, what are people thinking about? So we're constantly innovating and thinking about uh, interacting with new types of equipment. You mentioned how it's being used in Ukraine. Um, British soldiers are about to start trialing it. Um, how's it being used? How's it been received by the U.S. military? Yeah, there's. Um, it's been widely used by U.S. SOCOM units. Um, we, I think we're on our fourth or fifth rotation um, with USASOC down to SOUTHCOM, EUCOM, and CENTCOM. Um, and it is making its way into, you know, other operational theaters as well. And almost every flavor of SOF has used it. And then we're in talks with uh, the conventional army and the conventional Marine Corps to uh, 
uh, field foresight in mass to both of those entities. So pretty exciting to me. Owen Cahill, great to speak to you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Kate. Emily, um, it's incredible at the power of the devices we all carry around now. And Russia has exactly the same smartphone technology as we do. Do we have any idea if their software development is as advanced? Well, I think for Russia, the issue isn't so much whether they have the software, but whether they've got the people to manage it. So since the big mobilization drive that Russia had last year in September and October to call up sort of thousands of soldiers... This has resulted in a bit of a brain drain because a lot of people, particularly professionals at a sort of mid-level of their career, especially in the IT sector, left to go to places like Central Asia. And now I think there is a bit of recognition from the Kremlin that this is starting to be a problem because they've now introduced exemptions for, for military service for certain type of professions, especially in the technology sector. But I think this might be a sort of longer term demographic problem, the effects of which we're not quite clear about yet. Yeah, and the war is constraining Russia in terms of technology sanctions. Um, and in the last few weeks, a drone strike is reported to have hit one of Russia's own microchip factories, Kremi L. How is it actually affecting Russia's capability? So I think that at the moment, the war is not being fought in a particularly high tech way. And I think artillery is really the main thing that's in demand at the moment. Of course, technology plays an important role in, in guiding missiles and things like that. But, but what really both the Russians and the Ukrainians are burning through at the moment is, is artillery, which is why they need, from the Ukrainian side at least, you know, supplies from other European allies and why Russia is approaching countries like North Korea for that. Um, mm. So I think that is probably going to be the thing that's most in demand from the Russian side at the moment. And the economic sanctions, they were the deterrent and then one weapon directly wielded by NATO nations. Are they having any meaningful effect against Russia's war effort? Well, they're meaningful in the sense that they are forcing Russia to seek alternative trading partners. So there are certain parts that Russia needs, especially for things like uh, the trains and, and vehicles that are taking soldiers to the front. A lot of those parts they're now having to find from, from Central Asia and China, but formerly those were from, from European partners. But in terms of sort of how effective the sanctions are at changing p Russian people's minds and narratives around the war, I think I'd probably say no, because what the Kremlin is able to do with uh, the many propaganda tools at its disposal uh, is to encourage people to sort of rally around the flag and embrace this kind of siege mentality that the West wants to destroy and undermine Russia from within. And that's quite an effective narrative, really. And you mentioned um, North Korea, that visit by Kim Jong-un to Russia. Um, apart from artillery, do you think technology supply could also have been part of those talks? It could have been, uh, but it's probably not likely to be very high tech because a lot of the North Korean weaponry is, after all, reverse engineered Soviet models. Mm -hmm. um, so what they can provide is shells and ammunition. And I think, you know, on the back of that, there was a bit of discussion about whether for Russia this was... Uh, a bit of a step down asking such a sort of pariah country like North Korea for assistance. Um, but Russia really doesn't have very many options at the moment. And it's already talked about trying to roll back some of the sanctions that it was a party to through the UN on North Korea for that purpose. Well, Kim Jong-un went home with a number of gifts from the Kremlin. According to Russia's TASS news agency, they included a fur hat, a Russian-made rifle, a reconnaissance drone and five one-way attack drones. Not your usual diplomatic exchange of trinkets. The drones are a violation of UN sanctions against North Korea because of its development of nuclear weapons. Sanctions that Russia approved as one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. When President Zelensky addressed the Security Council a couple of days ago. He called for Russia to be stripped of its power of veto that allows it to block any decision in the Security Council. What we observe in the United Nations is an increasing support for an idea that in cases of mass atrocities against human rights, veto power should be voluntarily suspended. But we can also observe that Russia will not give up this stolen privilege voluntarily. Therefore, the UN General Assembly should be given a real power to overcome the veto. He's not the only one who thinks the Security Council structure is way past its sell-by date. Here's what Turkey's President Erdogan told fellow leaders. 
The Security Council has ceased to be the guarantor of world security and has become a battleground for the political strategies of only five countries. Emily, uh, that's a pretty damning assessment from President Erdogan, uh, a permanent member of the Security Council giving drones to the UN's biggest pariah state. Is this a deliberate Russian attempt to undermine the UN, to make it look utterly powerless? Well, yes, I'd have thought so. But but really, that's how Russia has been engaging on a lot of international platforms, frankly, for the past few years. So I think the Russian approach really is that when the UN can serve a purpose, and when it can further Russian interests, so as one of its permanent members, it's really important for Russia to have an opportunity to project its great power status and its global aspirations. Um, but its veto power also gives Moscow an opportunity to kind of undermine initiatives that run counter to its interests. And that's pretty much what we see in initiatives where last year, for example, I think there was um, a move by Russia and China to block a US proposal to introduce further sanctions uh, on North Korea. And the reason that they gave was the COVID situation in North Korea. But that really sort of shows you how they, Russia and China, tend to sort of club together to try to project their own interests through the platform. And is there any chance of radical change at the UN which might limit Russia's power of veto? Because, of course, that would also limit America's power of veto and Britain and China and France. I think it would be very difficult. Um, The the problem is really a difference of understanding um, and the fact that Russia sort of chooses to interpret international law along its own lines, and those lines are not very clear. Um, It's something that we've tried to get a lot of clarification on from people like Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, and he sort of suggested that the Western rules-based system is something that Russia does not hold itself accountable to, although obviously it's very difficult to know what that actually means in practice. And so that makes it really difficult to try to find any common ground with Russia. But the UN is really one of the last platforms through which Western countries are able to engage with Russia, at least. So I think it's still a really important arena for people to try to understand what some of Moscow's red lines are. So is there any hope of the UN or indeed any member state achieving any meaningful peacemaking in the Ukraine war? I think that there will probably be a lot of different processes around the way that the war will end. It's very difficult to know which one of these will come first. But I think whichever way the war ends, whether it's through engagement with the UN or people like the OSCE, whether it's a sort of uh, multilateral agreement between Russia and Ukraine and other parties, it's always going to be quite a messy process with multiple actors involved. Given the UN was set up to try to maintain peace um, and it now seems pretty powerless, uh, what future does it have? Well, I think it's a really important platform for engagement with countries that we don't necessarily have another relationship with. Because between the West and Russia at the moment, there's been an all but pretty much severing of diplomatic ties. I mean, we've got embassies in the country, at least from the British perspective, and we do have these sort of emergency contacts. But there are very few platforms for us to try to understand the Kremlin's thinking. And even though that might be a a sort of unpopular idea to, to listen to what the Russians have to say, I think it's very dangerous to ignore them, particularly at the moment. And I wonder if the UN is probably one of the most important ways through which we are still able to communicate what our values are to the Kremlin. Emily, we'll get some final thoughts from you a little later on on all of this, but let's turn our attention back to the UK. It's more than a decade since the creation of the Armed Forces Covenant, a legal framework designed to prevent military service, past or present, from disadvantaging you or your family. Of course, we know it was just the start of a long process rather than a revolutionary moment. For example, until a couple of years ago, there was no UK-wide system to ensure hospitals understand specific healthcare needs of veterans. Now, though, just over three quarters of NHS trusts are accredited as veteran aware, and healthcare professionals leading that effort have been meeting this week to look at how they share best practice. I've been talking to two of them, retired Lieutenant Colonel Guy Benson, the national team leader of the Veterans Covenant Healthcare Alliance, and Professor Tim Briggs, who chairs the alliance and is also honorary colonel of 202 Multi-Role Medical Regiment. He explained what veteran-aware accreditation actually means. 
they have to cover a, an eight-point plan where they can demonstrate they're aware of veterans. We have a clinical and a managerial diet in the hospital. They're linked into the charities, the NHS working and employing veterans, uh, stepping into health, all those scenarios where we can see veterans and absolutely signpost them to the charities, make sure they get the care they need to get in a timely fashion. Because when I was working uh, as a consultant of the Royal National Peak Hospital, veterans were referred to me and they had to go through a very convoluted route to get to where they needed to be, to get the care they needed sometimes. And I felt that that could be streamlined and embedded and made better. But the great thing that we do, we measure it. There's no point in just setting up these accreditation systems um, if they don't actually um, do what they see on the tin and they improve care. But we've got some really good early evidence now that we're actually we're, we are moving the dial and improving care for those veterans. So making a real difference, Guy, how does that experience manifest itself for a veteran if they're getting health care from a veteran-aware accredited NHS trust? Well, I think the first thing I'd say, Kate, is that the VCHA covers the whole armed forces community. So that's regular reservists, uh, veterans, and indeed family members. So uh, what would normally happen is once a, a trust is accredited, they will ask the question, have you served or are you close to someone who has served? Once a trust have identified that you are a member of the armed forces community, they can put that metaphorical arm around you and, and, you know, enhance that sort of care. So that might be connecting you to the third sector in terms of military charities. It might be the staff are, are aware that you're a veteran. And they've, they've been trained in the nuances of veterans. So, again, they can talk to you with a bit of knowledge about ranks in the forces, operational theatres, pressures on families. So it's that enhancing that experience and again at discharge the question is have you got somewhere appropriate to live and if that Mm. veteran says no actually i haven't uh, the trust will automatically link into the local authority and try and provide accommodation for them Um, and guess what of course that veteran won't have any money so they'll link into a service charity to provide funding you know that whole sort of application of, of enhanced care so, so, Guy, it's about what three quarters of NHS trusts that are signed up to to being veteran aware, but that still leaves what yeah. one in four not veteran aware. What does that mean for the experience of veterans attending those hospitals? It it, it might be suboptimal. Um, you know, trusts are, are under huge pressures, but you know, it's really important that that, that trust once they become veteran aware, they will treat the veterans, you know, with that enhanced care. Um, you know, most trusts, you know what, they'll probably look after their patients pretty well, but this will just enhance the care of, of that armed forces community cohort. Can I just I'm add sorry. there that um, of the remaining trusts, of, of the remaining 56, 22 are in progress one, 32 in progress two, and only two where we've had no um, engagement at all and we will we will deal with that so the other trusts are coming on board so i'm fairly confident by march 2024 we will have everybody accredited and it'll be a blanket across the country which is fantastic and tim we know how much pressure or you know how much pressure the nhs is under as a whole doctors and nurses have to do the best they can for the greatest number of people they can right now is it realistic though to, to ask for special consideration for veterans so I, I think that what we've got is just remember that all veterans are NHS patients. And what we're doing now in the NHS is working very hard to re- reduce the waiting times for our patients on the elective waiting list. And then also making sure that we get our cancer times right and we, we improve our UEC performance. So that affects both NHS patients and veterans. In the NHS, I'm the National Director of Clinical Improvement, and my aim is not a, is, is to improve the care for all of us that use the NHS, veterans and NHS patients. What we're asking with the, the Armed Forms, Forces Covenant is that these, these veterans are not disadvantaged, and what I want to make sure is that we can not only do that, but exemplar best practice, because if we get that right, Kate, we're going to cascade that into the NHS. Both NHS and veterans will, will benefit from that. Uh, Guy, anecdotally, we still hear a lot of the stories of veterans struggling to access the healthcare they need, and accreditation alone won't solve everything, will it? 
No, it, it won't. But do you know what? We are getting there. If you turn the clock back 10 years, you know, it was pretty poor, actually. Um, we are improving all the time. It's not perfect. But it's also about them specially clinically commissioned um, operations. So Operation Courage, which is mental health for the military community, the Operation Restore, which is the Veterans Trauma Network, which deals with uh, injuries that were sustained during service, and uh, especially if, if you retired. So we are actually joining that, all that together. Um, this is the start of, you know, a brilliant program, actually. Um, a much smaller proportion of GP surgeries are deemed veteran aware. That's not your scheme. That's the Royal College of GP scheme. But if that awareness isn't available at the usual first point of contact, does that actually stand in the way of your best practice being put into use and in helping veterans? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um I think, yes, they are quarter of the way through at the moment, I think, the GP-friendly uh, scheme, but we work quite closely with them. Uh, and, of course, the end state, we would want every GP to be friendly. And they are actually looking at sort of accrediting the primary care networks now, which will will obviously link in. But it also links into the integrated care systems as well, joining up all them sort of dots, if you like. So... I don't think there'll be a degradation in healthcare. They just won't get that enhanced wraparound care. Tim, what advice would you give to veterans who feel they're struggling to access healthcare or have their needs recognised? So what I'd say to that is that um, now we've got 76% of all trusts that we are now veteran aware. They will know about veterans and be ready for veterans. Uh, And therefore, I think veterans can approach those with confidence. We're in a much better place than we were even five years ago. And I think that by March next year, we'll have 100% coverage. I fully expect it to be that. And I think that's going to make a very big difference indeed. We know that we then go back to them at a year for an informal visit. And then three years, there's a reaccreditation process. So trust can't just apply, sit on their laurels. What we want to see is demonstrate progress. So we make sure veterans get the enhanced care and the care they really need. Timothy Briggs, Guy Benson, thank you so much for your time. Delighted. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. News, discussions and analysis. This is Zitrap. Now, before we go, let's uh, get the opportunity to delve a bit more into Emily's insight of Russia. Um, Emily, um, we've talked about how the Ukraine war is biting into Russia's military capability. We've talked about the geopolitics of it all. But what about Russia's domestic politics? We've just seen regional elections there. Do they show any sign that President Putin's regime may be in any trouble? Well, I think probably the most interesting thing about those elections wasn't really the results themselves, because they were a bit of a foregone conclusion, given what we know about the way that the Kremlin uh, intervenes in election processes in its own country. Um, And obviously, we saw sort of sweeping wins for Putin's United Russia Party. Um, But really, the way that the campaign was actually run and what that showed about how the Kremlin's trying to uh, tap into the Russian public's feelings about the war. So what happened was most candidates didn't really talk about the war. And the ones that did, using kind of symbolism or appearing in uniform, talking to voters, actually didn't do very well. What's quite important is that showed that the public isn't actually really particularly united around that patriotic messaging around the war. So for the Kremlin, when it's preparing for the presidential elections in March, they're going to have to try to find something else that's going to land better. And just out of interest, Emily, um, you are a research fellow at RUSI, and this is your specialist area, Russia. What are you working on at the moment? What's catching your eye? So, frankly, we're looking very closely at the presidential elections that are coming up uh, in March. So we were just talking about the election cycle uh, that just happened, the the regional elections. And this is really part of an enormous process uh, of, of sort of, Uh, public voting uh, for the next president. And whilst that might sort of raise the question about whether elections even matter in Russia, because we know that they're they're rather a foregone conclusion, I think what's really important is the way that the Kremlin relates to the Russian public and what the Kremlin thinks is important. So what we'll be looking at is some of the messaging around the war, some of the narratives, um, and how the Kremlin is really able to create this sort of Putinist system that is designed to, to outlive Putin long after he's gone. You're going to be very busy. Emily, Emily Ferris, great to have you on the programme. Thank you very much for sparing the time. That's all for now. Professor Michael Clark will be back with me for another sit rep next Thursday. Don't forget, you can always catch up online at bfbs.com slash sit rep or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thanks for listening. Bye bye. 